So you're Jam Master Jay's son. What was it like growing up in the family of Jam Master Jay being the, you know, how important Run DMC is? It was cool, man. Um, my family kept it very normal, you know, like my dad kept it very normal. Mom kept it very normal as well. She, they just wanted us to live like a normal life. Uh, so we went to school like everybody else did, did, did normal things. The only thing that, it, that was different was when like my father would come and pick us up from school, you know, and just the reaction that um, we would get from other parents or other kids or in the mall or amusement parks and stuff like that. That's when I kind of realized that, that life was a little bit different for us, but they did a great job of keeping everything cool and normal. So like, what were some of the things that would happen when you'd be out with your dad? Like, we'd be out and somebody would run up and have them sign their Adidas sneaker, you know? Or like, um, be like, yo, King of Rock changed my life, or Tougher Than Leather changed my life, or that was the first album I ever bought, you know? And hearing that stuff was like, I, I was still super young at the time, you know? He passed when I was 11, so this was all happening prior to that, you know? Um, so as a young kid, I was kind of soaking it up, but as I get older and as I've gotten older, like, it's become so much more real to me and I've actually, been able to really, really get to kind of um, like just soak in the the impact that Jam Master J and Run DMC had on everything. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm a big Run DMC fan. I, I actually Run DMC's first album, you know, the black and white uh, cover, yeah, was I believe the first hip hop album that I ever bought. Like yeah. I'd had some singles from like you know Grandmaster Flash and, and the Furious yeah. Five and stuff like that, but but that was the first actual album that I bought. That's it, dope. It definitely made a big impact. Hell yeah, that's sick. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's how it goes. Now, you were, you were 11 years old when your dad got killed. Yeah. What, what happened during the moment when you were told what happened? Um, so we were actually on our way to Virginia um, because my grandmother lived in Virginia at the time. And um, me and my mom and Jesse and my great-grandmother were on our, on our way to Virginia to celebrate Halloween out there. And um, so my mom got, got the call as we're on the turnpike. Um, uh, we've pretty much you turned on the turnpike, like literally just about faced, drove back to the city. And um, I didn't like, she didn't really tell me what was going on. She didn't really know exactly, you know, it's like, it's gotta be a very shocking moment at the time, you know, like to really, to kind of take that in. So, um, and I was really young at the time too. So I'm sure it's impossible to like, be able to tell me what's possibly going on. So um, we kind of just went back home um, she dropped us off. She went. She went to the scene, and uh, yeah, I found out because I was just. I turned on the TV, and it was on the news, um, like immediately. Yeah, that's like that's kind of how I found out. I saw my mom on there and everything. So it's a pretty surreal moment um, for all of us, you know. Like I didn't really know how to take it in, but um, my mom's super strong. My family is incredibly strong, you know. So we just got through it, and and um, it's we're we are where we are today. So you actually didn't know what was happening you turned on the tv and you yeah. see your dad on tv with the news that he had been murdered yeah yeah that must have been pretty hard even 11 years old yeah it was tough it was tough you know but like i said very strong family you know so we were able to get through it what happened right after you know you found out about the murder you know because there still is not a lot of information right now but at the time no one knew what happened. Were you guys in fear for your lives and that type of thing? Nah, we weren't. We weren't scared for our lives or anything. Um, we, it, we, we just didn't get those vibes from the situation. And my, and my mom is like, she's got the instinct of a, a superwoman, you know. So like, she knew to, she knew that we were safe. We had surveillance, of course, um, like at our house. But we ended up moving to Virginia about a year after, um, a year after it happened. So we finished out our school year in New York and then moved to Virginia the, the, the following year. So what do you mean you had surveillance at your house? Oh, we would, we would just have like cops like hanging out outside, just security um, at all times, just because of course it wasn't, and it wasn't really for anything negative, you know, but there would be people coming to the house to send their condolences, to give flowers, you know, just respecting JMJ. So um, just with, with, with that and people having our public record of being where we lived, it just, we just needed the security to be there, but it wasn't for anything negative, like we weren't in fear. Of anything really okay so now that when you look at the situation mm -hmm. you know this happened what year again um this happened in 2002 2002 you fast forward 14 years to 2016 the murder is still unsolved yeah how does that make you feel as a son that 
whoever did this didn't get brought to justice and didn't have to pay for what they did? Um, it's it's tough at times, you know, because we there there are plenty of situations where um, they go gung ho, or, and and they as I, I mean, just like the like our our police force and um, just justice in general, um, they'll go gung ho for something that that is very minuscule in comparison to somebody losing their lives, you know? And um, when somebody loses their lives, it's just like whatever, it's black on black crime, like we don't really care about it, you know? So looking back on it now, it's, it's, it's pretty tough to know that that um, nothing, like justice really hasn't been served and people don't want to talk and, and, and that type of thing. But at the same time, like we kind of just got to leave it up to God, you know, and just kind of let that handle the, or be handled the way it's supposed to be handled, you know? It's like, it's. It's, it's, it's really not in our hands anymore to kind of figure out what's going to happen with that. Well, you've said in your, in your Breakfast Club interview that people know what happened. Yeah, I feel like people definitely do know what happened. You know, I feel like there was only a few amount of people in that studio at the time, and they're all close friends of his, supposedly, you know. And, um, and yeah, there's no way that somebody can... The, the way that the police report is written, there's no way that people can walk into that room People can be led up into that room, and um, and the action like or and what happened to have happened, and nobody know what happened, you know. So it's like, of course, people know it, know what the deal is, and or know or know something, and they just don't want to talk, you know. So, so the exact situation, from what you understand it, uh, explain it to me. Um, I'd rather not. <laughs> I'd rather. Okay. Yeah. F- f- fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. So, the people that were in the room. Did you ever talk to any of these people yourself? Um, beforehand, but never, never after. Why not never after? There's a lot of things changed after my pops passed. You know, like we we just didn't have a communication with a lot of people after that. So he was, or the like the people in the in that room were definitely the ones that we just didn't really communicate with after, for reasons that of course like we don't trust them. Like how could you be in a room when my father was shot and killed, but you don't even like there's. You, you know nothing, you know, so, yeah. You never feel the need to go in and try to confront some of these people or at least have, not even confront them, but even have a conversation with them about it? Um, I was so young when it happened, you know, so there was a long period of time where it was like a lot of growing. I needed to do a lot of growing. I needed to do a lot of soaking in. And it's coming up to the point where it's like, yeah, I am old enough to have conversations with these people, but do I want to bring up... Um, do I want to like do I? It's, I feel like that's a lot of negative energy, you know. And I'm very, I'm a very positive person. I block out a lot of negative energy all the time, you know. I don't even that energy doesn't even like come around like our crew of people just because that's not how we are. So I feel like, um, like going and confronting people about something that that's happened. Um, it's just like, it's it's not it's not. I don't even really feel like it's my place, you know. Like I feel like God's handling that the way He's got to handle it. Do you think you know who did it? I don't. I don't. Honestly, it's like there's so there's hearsay of this, there's hearsay of that, but I really have no clue, you know. And um, yeah, that's frustrating because you know, I mean, a, a lot of the, the the major crimes, the hip hop crimes that have happened, like you know, Tupac and Biggie. Like I've talked to people that were kind of close to the situation, and they've told me certain things that essentially was common knowledge in the neighborhood. Yeah. Of, of, of you know, like, of, of where it happened. So it, it, it must definitely be upsetting to, to not even have that type of story to even, to even know. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's weird, but I mean, we just kind of do our thing to keep the positive awareness uh, alive, you know? Just like, that's, that's really my goal. That's my brother's goal. We're just here to kind of just make sure that everything around JMJ stays positive, you know, regardless of, of the past and like what's happened yeah uh, have you ever talked to 50 cent oh uh, yeah definitely um we did we did an event with him a few months back uh, it was a charity event and um it was actually for the for the gem master j foundation for music and um we were out there just with some kids out at summer stars camp in connecticut or actually it was it was um boston yeah massachusetts yeah so i got to hang out with him he told us about his relationship with my pops and stuff it was cool well, Jam Master J was the one who discovered Fifty Cent. Yeah, yep. And and gave Legendary. him well, got him his first record deal. Yeah, with uh, Columbia Records, I believe. Yep. So so, from from your point of view, what was the relationship you know between Fifty and Jam Master J? You know, based on what he told you. 
Yeah, um, it was dope. It was just like they were, um, I, they, they linked at a club or something. Um, my dad passed him in the car. He was like, oh shit, that's Jam Master J. So he reached out to him, like, yo. They got in the club, they were talking. Um, and he said that he wasn't even really, like, 50 was like just, just beginning to rap, you know? So my father was teaching him about bar structure and like how to write, write, how to write hooks and um, just counting on beat and stuff. So um, pretty much just taught him how, how to make music. And my father saw the talent in him and was like, yo, this guy's gonna be great. And um, yeah, they, 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 they went to work together, which was dope. 50 cents. Yeah, I mean, he, he went on to become a superstar. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it's interesting how, how Jay was the first person to see it. And I, I remember reading some of the, the early interviews with 50, and, and 50 wasn't even a rapper at the time. Yeah. He just looked like a rapper exactly. based on the car he drove yeah. and the jewelry he had on. And I guess Jay approached him and was like, yo, like, do you rap? And 50 was like, nah, but yeah. I, I'll fuck with it, you know? And, and Jay actually groomed him. Yeah. Is that, is that the story you pretty much heard? Yeah, that, that's what he told me. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look online, uh, some, of the, some of the stories that have come out, uh, there was supposed to be a tying in between your dad's murder and Supreme and 50 Cent and some of the situations that happened around that. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you looked into that. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, I did my research. Um, but that's all hearsay, you know, it's like there's there's no prime evidence or, you know, that's not like real. So I can't really put any energy into that until it's actual, actually factual, you know. Um, it's just not the energy that I want to put out there either. So until I get like facts, that's when I'll actually be like, okay, word, you know. But that's, I, I can't see that being true. And do you feel like the, the police department really hasn't put in the type of effort that they should to actually solve this? Definitely not. You know, definitely not. I mean, like like I said, at the time I was very young when it all happened, so I couldn't really understand. But looking back and kind of doing research again, it's like I don't I don't feel like enough was done at all. Well, when it comes to murder, there's no statute of limitations. Yeah. So something that happened 20, 30, 100 years ago could still be prosecuted. Yeah. Um, you know, did you ever try to to talk to the police or, or you know, campaign or, or do something to, to try to get them to reopen the case? Nope, but that's something that we're looking into now. You know, like now that now that we're old enough and we're, we've actually got, we can actually kind of hold on and get a reins of everything that's going on. You know, like we can actually get, get in control and we've actually got say and we've got like some type of, um, some type of voice. I feel like we, we could actually get something done now. Absolutely. Now, now after the passing happened, how much did the hip hop community really come to really support you guys and help you guys out? Um, and a great deal, you know. Um, I remember the funeral was incredibly beautiful. You know, like the wake was incredibly beautiful. Saw a lot of faces there, a lot of familiar faces, you know. Um, and it just showed like how much he was actually respected and like what type of impact he had, you know. And uh, it was dope, it was dope. I understand that mindset because I like have that like because you don't believe in somebody so much you just joke on them like I'm gonna joke on you I don't believe you mm -hmm. so I understand it but you know I want hip-hop period like yeah. to stop the shenanigans with that type of shit like yo motherfucker rap go rap my monthly uh, overhead for my household and employee just household employees was somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars a month I was spending. 